Selection Error by Claire L. Deming Too dangerous, said the cowards. Too expensive, said the bureaucrats. Too far away, said the experts. They used the same arguments again and again. Space exploration had devolved into a competition to be the lowest bidder and the contractor with the greatest safety margins and the least daring goals. The price of obtaining new knowledge had grown astronomically. The prospect of sending a breathing, observing, thinking person to gather that knowledge had become an impossibility. A plume of vapor triggers autonomous programming. The schema activates, and rotors whir soundlessly in vacuum. Sensors sense, collectors collect. All systems operate in a predetermined response to a stimulus. The developers and engineers on Earth had planned it all. They had envisioned what the rover would do on Io. Nanobots are released and investigate the plateau, searching for chemical traces and other triggers. Ground rumbles with the intermittent volcanism in the region. Far too dangerous for manned exploration. The rover rolls on toward a cluster of odd rocks, that a nanobot just photographed. A geologist role schema begins to run. The rover calls back the other nanobots to avoid an activation error. Too many schemas in play at once could cause a memory lapse, wasting valuable battery life. When the docket unit clears the horizon and a quota is reached, all data will be uploaded to speed on to Earth. The rover rotates with Io, the docker units orbit Io, and Io orbits Jupiter. It is the most efficient approach to communications at this distance, especially when Io moves behind, interfering moons, rings, or the bulk of Jupiter. Just use larger telescopes, some said. Fling them into orbit for a better view. First Hubble, then Spitzer, Kepler, and Webb. Images and data flowed back to Earth. For planetary missions, robotics flourished as new innovations and technology allowed the rovers, probes, and cameras to shrink in size with each successive project. Lower mass meant less money spent on propulsion, and there was certainly no risk to human life. New developments in the artificial intelligence allowed autonomy. Fewer human inputs were needed, and that also diminished the chance of human error. The ever-present risk that had felled earlier explorers in aviation and aerospace history. The geologist role schema concludes, data are stored, and the rover restarts its scientific search schema. Cameras flick on and off, sensors seek a new focus, seismographs plot out faults and magma domes. The docker unit rises over the horizon and emits its radio signal to the rover. Data are transferred, already half analyzed. Soon the scientists and statisticians will be obsolete. The docker unit follows its orbit and sets before the vista of Jupiter's swirling clouds. A human might describe the beauty of Io's horizon. Licks of volcanic fire like solar flares against the corona, all suspended before the mutability of the gas giant storms. The rover records and passes along the data. Thousands of extrasolar planets spun in habitable zones in hundreds of star systems. On some, water has been identified. On others, spectra indicated volcanic activity. Fuzzy images of distant worlds taunted the imagination. We thought we knew what to look for, but we had barely explored our own solar system. Extrasolar dreams of life in the universe would remain dreams. Better than nightmares, some said seeing flying saucers, little green men, and sinister galactic empires as an eventuality if we dared to venture so far. Better to remain ignorant. A new radio signal fills the hemisphere of sky over the rover. Nanobots return, and science ceases. It is time to go home. The rover starts the takeoff event schema. There is no thought involved, no inputs from Earth. Everything is automated. In ruddy skies filled with refracted sunlight, a foreign orb of dull metal hovers in a geosynchronous orbit over the rover, watching and waiting for a response. The rover's nose folds over instruments. Samples are secured and thrusters ignite. Escape velocity is reached. Docking event schema ensues. 
but the Docker unit is not there. The alien orb observes and hovers, awaiting an answer. The rover has no schema for this. The orb emits its mimicking signal again, and the rover almost recognizes it, but is subtly different from that of the Docker unit. Selection error. An external trigger activates an inappropriate schema. A human carries a dirty dinner plate to the kitchen, but dumps half-eaten bits of food in the bathroom sink because a part of the subconscious recognizes the sink as the trigger. Deemed the most dangerous type of error for an autonomous rover, it cannot plan for the unexpected or adopt for the unforeseen. The rover floats over Io, helpless and lost. It cannot find the docker unit or continue its mission. Having received no answer, the orb leaves to follow its predetermined path, ignoring the watery world and the inner solar system. Had it only been programmed to explore the region near gas giants? In the great night of the cosmos, the rover remains ever ignorant of its visitor, unable to observe and quantitate the discrepancy between science and wonder. Dear listeners, are you looking for a new book to read? Are you a fan of The Martian by Andy Weir or First Contact Stories? Then I have the perfect recommendation for you. Pick up a copy of Fran Tabor's To Own Two Sons. In the year 2112, one man must defy galactic odds, earn the recognition of an alien species, or all humanity will die. Jerison's fragile research vessel is the first manned spaceship to venture beyond Neptune. He and his crew plan to research exotic Kupler Belt objects. Instead, the defenseless crew encounters a lone Morgai scout. Captain Jerison faces great odds. Can he reveal human greatness? To pick up your copy, click on the link below. everyone, and welcome to Utopia Science Fiction, the podcast. Today we are joined by our design editor, Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. So today we're going to talk about art, um, and just kind of in honor of our upcoming December issue, uh, which is our special art issue, which features a whole bunch of amazing artists. So for this podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about art. So why, why do you think that art is important? What do you think the importance of art is? The importance of art in uh, speculative fiction. Well, it has two purposes. Uh, one is to help jumpstart the uh, reader's imagination uh, because you're dealing with the unreal, something far beyond what most readers will have ever experienced. And it's also essential to setting the tone and the mood of the story. You've heard the age-old lie, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, we always judge books by their covers. Mm. Um, and so that first illustration is so key to conveying what the story is and the world that it is set in. No, I think you raised a good point. It helps us to augment our imagination when we're reading books. It gives us the additional um, depth to explore. And it's also, I think it's uh, essential to creating and maintaining a suspension of disbelief when you're reading a science fiction or fantasy story. Because sometimes you can start reading all these wonderful descriptions and then just get lost in them and not sure what exactly is going on. Mm -hmm. um, and this was especially true, you know, the works of uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Uh, Wells. Um, while their stories were being published in magazines, the illustrations helps to help the audience imagine this potential new reality 
long before it would actually become reality. Thinking of all those pulp magazines from like 30s, 40s, 50s, is that art sells those exciting colors, those um, strange locales. It grabs people's attention. Um, so there's also the financial aspect to it. Of course, of course. Um, which is the only important aspect to the art. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask anyone in the publishing industry. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading a really cool article the other day about how the earliest artists going back like 70,000 years, they think that art became commonplace in culture as part of like, um, they thought the earliest artists were autistic or on the autistic spectrum. And that in order to help them visualize and describe the world, they started to create these cave paintings and artwork and things like that, which I just found very interesting. Hmm. I'll have to send me a link to that article at some point. Yeah, it's really cool. Just looking at like the origins of how art started off and how we all owe all of our art today has its origins from people on the neurodivergent community. Somehow it's not surprising. <laughs> Speaking as someone who is on that uh, spectrum. Yeah, yeah. But I think art's also been used to tell, a, to tell a story just by the art itself. I'm just thinking, again, I'm thinking from like historical context. And you start going to these archaeological sites. You, you start excavating these murals and you learn about the culture. And you learn about history and what things were like back then. So art kind of preserves the moment as well. So it has, you know, it's both to help create a picture in the mind of things in the future, but it also works in the reverse fashion where it helps to create a picture of what things used to be like, too. It's a great historical record. And an examination of the artist's uh, views on the world and what they thought of it at the time might not be the most factual, but... Um gives a perspective on what people thought of what they were going through. We've had a really amazing opportunity at Utopia to interview some amazing, like top-notch science fiction and fantasy and speculative fiction artists like Michael Whelan, um, Vincent DeFate. We have one coming up with um, Jim Burns. And one of the questions I sometimes ask is why science fiction art? Or what do you hope people walk away with um, once they've seen this particular art? And the answer, a lot of times, most of the time, I would say it comes back to not just capturing wonder, but inspiring a sense of wonder. And I think that's a lot about what, you know, speculative fiction is about, is inspiring wonder. Yeah, and the entire genre is built on that. And art and uh, science fiction have that uh, aspirational aspect to them. Mm. So who are some of your favorite artists? They could be, you know, science fiction, speculative fiction, or not science fiction or speculative fiction. But like, who do you, per who do you admire as an artist? So you've already mentioned some, um, Michael Whelan, um, James Gurney, John Eaves, who worked on Star Trek, Brian Froud, Ralph McQuarrie, James Cameron, Ridley Scott, mm. H.R. Giger. Even if H.R. Giger isn't exactly utopian, <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be a challenge, is to take Giger's biomechanical style and try to make it hopeful and optimistic. I think also that it's fun sometimes to look at an artist or a writer and see who inspired them. And I feel like H.R. H. R. Giger inspired a lot of artists and authors that branched out into different kinds of um, styles. So it's still an important art, important artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was Ralph McQuarrie's uh, paintings that convinced Fox Studios to support Star Wars. Ridley Scott's storyboards for Alien allowed him to increase the budget for the film by, like, I think, a million dollars at least. So 
do you think there's like a common theme tying together all of these artists that you've named? Aside from being involved in speculative fiction, um, a lot of them have certainly inspired a lot of other artists a uh, after them as well. Like James Gurney's uh, Dinotopia was a huge inspiration for the uh, celebration scene at the end of The Phantom Menace, just as one example. He was actually uh, contacted by George Lucas, who was inspired by, I think, a scene from Dinotopia, a parade of some sort through Waterfall City. Yeah. So that sort of inspired the whole Gungan celebration at the end. Yeah. I love, like, James Gurney is one of my favorite artists. Just the way, like, he uses color and, like, the kind of pastel softness to it. Um, um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting art inspires the artist, inspires the person that inspired them in the first place. Gurney was inspired partly by, you know, films like Star Wars and Indiana Jones to create Dinotopia. And so it sort of came around full circle. I've always, you know, I, he's, not, he's, not, he's not speculative fiction, but I've always liked um, Toulouse Lautrec's work. I am not familiar with him, unfortunately. I'm only familiar with Toulouse Lautrec because I did a project for a French class way, way back in was it high school or maybe even like before that. Um, and I chose Toulouse Lautrec, or I was assigned to Toulouse Lautrec. He was an Impressionist, French Impressionist, um, 1860s to 1900, I think he passed away. But he does, he does very interesting, um, just the color and the style. And I also like, um, again, not technically a speculative fiction artist, but um, I have been developing an appreciation for Salvador Dali because, you know, going back to what you said earlier, because I read a story once, forgetting the author's name, but it was Soft Clocks, just the name of the short story. And it takes place mm -hmm. on this. I think we did a podcast about this, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I think we did. So... Basically, it's about this person that goes to Mars, and Mars is owned by, by a descendant of Salvador Dali. And as the story progresses, the story becomes more and more surreal, and it eventually becomes a, the person is actually trapped in the Salvador Dali painting. Very interesting, very weird, but fun enough. And I think after reading that, I started to get a much more, I started to look up uh, Salvador Dali paintings, and I definitely had more of an appreciation for it. So the Art, the story inspired interest in the artist. Also, I think going back to the question, you know, why is art important? I think that art has a kind of power to it, to change how we see the world, to help us to change perspectives. There's a fantastic Voyager episode called Muse that I just saw recently. And it's about this character on this planet who creates a play that he believes has the power to stop these warlords from fighting. And it kind of highlights that. So I think, you know, art, art has that power. I know that episode sort of, I've only seen bits and pieces of it. It's definitely one I want to go back and watch all the way through. So what do you think um, the future of art is? Well, in some ways, uh, could be interesting. Um, other ways, it's kind of scary especially with the rise of AI art. We could almost do a long podcast just on that, on the ethical and legal issues surrounding it. The, um, the question, who owns AI artwork? Is it the programmer who creates the software, the person who uses the software to create the artwork, or the AI itself? There's a fun, fun question there, fun philosophical question there. <laughs> And there's also been a bit of a uh, controversy because uh, DeviantArt has been developing their own AI art software and they've been using the posts by um, their community to help train it. Well, the thing is, at first they didn't even offer the option to opt out of that. And then when faced with backlash, they 
allotted on an individual basis, so you had to manually for every single piece turn it off or tell them that you would not let DeviantArt use this to train their AI. And then they gave them backlash over that part. That was when they finally allowed for a mass opt-out feature, and uh, apparently, at least according to some, it's still their work is still being used without mm. their permission. And I mean, I haven't dug too deeply into whether all of that is true, um, but it's something that's making me reconsider uh, continuing to post there because of you know I've I've been there for over ten years now, and this is. Yeah, this is certainly murky territory. Yeah. There's certainly going to be a lot of artists and artist estates that are going to be protesting uh, the use of their work. Um, one thing I am concerned about as an artist who's wanted to get into the film or video game industry, I do have the concern that you know these entertainment companies will start phasing out like concept artists in favor of the AI because it'll be faster and cheaper. And I'm sure you can get a lot more samples from an AI that's just spitting things randomly out than an artist who has to think about these things um, and actually puts care and thought into their work. Yeah, I mean, that being said, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near that stage yet. And any company that jumps the gun on that is probably going to be facing some serious backlash. Mm. Um, but that said, it also kind of creates a new art form in and of itself, which is creating the prompts for the AI to use. Mm. Um, because it still can't do this stuff completely on its own yet. <laughs> Yeah, um, it needs to gather data and information and... Yep, and one thing that could be an interesting development is because there's also been some writing AI developed. So there is some potential interest one day one AI might generate a prompt for the artist AI to develop into a picture, which could be interesting. I feel like... And maybe it's just the inner, like, cantankerous old person in me. But I feel like once we've exported uh, writing and art and creating art to AIs, we have basically sold our souls to the machines. Uh, although, that being said, I've seen some very interesting things, interesting works come out from AIs. Yeah, I mean, there's no denying it has really developed pretty well. And Considering how recently it's uh, entered the public consciousness, it has done an amazing amount of work. And one thing that is a definite issue that I've faced with DeviantArt and AI is um, I've actually had a hard time distinguishing between an AI-generated image and an actual and something done by an actual artist. So. Which is slightly terrifying uh, <laughs> but it does it, it shows how far these things have advanced I did um, I did a brief editorial on AI as an emerging concept for Utopia's letter to the editor a few years ago and already like two three years later it's become pretty commonplace there's even a um, a bot in discord you can add onto your servers that will produce AI-generated art based on prompts that you give it. Yeah, it, it's uh, kind of terrifying, but at the same time, you know... Have you heard of um, like the virtual reality art exhibits and things that are going on through uh, VR? I haven't learned so much about that as uh, seeing some people using VR to create art. Like one of my favorite YouTubers... Jazza, who's an Australian artist, a little bit of a nut. He has done a couple of um, videos where he's uh, sculpted in VR to produce things for 3D printing. It certainly has some interest. I think There's an idea that I sort of uh, started to think of is 
if we were able to combine like something that uh, I think we've uh, been developing some technologies that can enable blind people to see. And I think it could be interesting to combine that technology with VR and see the images that those people come up with. Yeah. Certainly um, a lot of potential there. there. There's a lot of potential in virtual reality art. And one thing is that in virtual reality art, you don't need to pay for all of the um, components that go into it, like the paper, the paints. So there's a there's a financial benefit to creating something in a virtual space, but also you can, you can do more creative things. You can expand outside of just a two dimensional space. Um, there's all, there's those traveling art exhibits like Van Gogh. And I think Monet is in New York at the moment. I don't actually know where I was going with that thought. So it's Van Gogh. Van Gogh. <laughs> it's Van Gogh. Yes. <laughs> All right, I think that's about all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining uh, joining me. And Thank you for uh, putting up with me. <laughs> Anytime. All right, I will see you around. Bye, everyone. Hello, listeners. You've been listening to Utopia Science Fiction, the podcast. If you'd like to continue to support Utopia Science Fiction in publishing our great magazine and continuing our podcast, please consider clicking the Support Us Patreon link below. A special thanks to those who have already subscribed to our Patreon and to our Kickstarter supporters from last year's campaign. And to all of you, readers and listeners alike, who help make what we do possible. I, I leave you all now with our bold refrain. Let us go onward, ever onward, onward, through the impossible, 